This presentation is related to the three chapters on education and knowledge transfer. In it, my goal is to give an overview of how education and knowledge transfer changed in Europe from the early modern period to contemporary times. While discussing each period, I will be concentrating on certain issues, such as the educational system, its structure from elementary schools to the university level, its function in the different societies and its availability, as well as the different national and international frameworks in which scientific knowledge developed and the main differences between the regions of Europe. In the 16th century, great humanist reformers as Erasmus could already build on a tradition that had been established since the mid 14th century when scholars attempted to breathe new life into Roman and Greek antiquity. The new Studia Humanitatis was implemented at the schools of famous humanist educators. Nevertheless, it proved more difficult to change the curricula of universities, these rather conservative institutions, which continued to be dominated by theology fac faculties until the end of the early modern period. Universities retained the base hierarchy of three major faculties, theology, law, and medicine, with a propedeutic faculty consisting of the liberal arts. Despite all the religious differences throughout Europe, the hierarchy and methods in science and scholarship were surprisingly similar across the continent. The institutional landscape was in broad terms largely the same across Europe. The secondary tier prepared students for a tertiary education based on scholastic and humanist learning rooted in a productive combination of Greco-Roman and Christian traditions, which were also shaped in many ways by Arabic and Jewish scholarship. Although Erasmus himself frequently staged women who outsmarted their male interlocutors, academia kept its doors closed to women. While primary education was open to girls, secondary and in particular tertiary education was not. Nevertheless, notwithstanding the similarities in structure and certain trends, important regional particularities can be detected as well. The Third Years' War, which was one of the most tragic events in the history of early modern Central Europe, had grave effects on the region's intellectual life as it led to a massive displacement of scholars. Many Protestants in Central Europe and Eastern Europe fled westward to Dutch gymnasia and universities, or eastward to Transylvania. The Moravian educator of European fame, Jan Amos Komensky, or Comenius, was one of them. He taught in Sharos Patak from 1650, and there he wrote his Orbis Sensualium Pictus, a multilingual elementary textbook with illustrative engravings. Moving to Lesno and then fleeing Catholic prosecution, he arrived in Amsterdam in 1657, where plans to make him a professor foundered. Yet he exercised a profound inf influence on later generations of educators, a consequence of his activity in English, Dutch, German intellectual networks, alongside his education theories regarding curricula that could feed the natural development of children. The activities of such scholars as Comenius led to modern practice-oriented subjects finding their way into curricula including geography, mathematics, or experimental physics, which incorporated the theories of Leibniz, Wolf, and Newton. However, the assumption that the devastation of the Thirty Years' War destroyed the institutions and networks of learning is exaggerated. In fact, scholars, teachers, and learned book trade proved remarkably resilient. Political fragmentation did not cripple the educational system, but enriched it. Latin schools proved tremendously flexible and independent in attending to local needs and, and regional competition. In the Habsburg territory, the teaching of elementary knowledge in all major and some minor localities took place in primary schools run by Catholic parishes and Protestant ministries. The main goal was to acquaint students with the basic principles of religion and ethics. In relation to these, the basics of reading and possibility, possibly writing and counting in the mother tongue of the localities. 
These institutions were attended primarily by children of craftsmen and merchants. Until the advent of the Counter-Reformation, the Protestant provincial schools acquired the leading role in education, especially secondary education, of noblemen and urban citizens. The victory of the Counter-Reformation in the Thirty Years' War, however, meant the collapse of the Protestant school st structure. As a result, the educational system of the hereditary lands took on a Catholic ecclesiastic character. From the middle of the 18th century, under the reign of Maria Teresa and Joseph II, the educational reforms introduced in the Habsburg Empire brought about spectacular methodological and structural changes in the school system on each level, from elementary schools to universities. Practices characterized by concepts rooted in Enlightenment thinking, such as utility or citizens' welfare, and the duty of the ruler to take care of their subjects, came into the fore when the whole imperial school system was taken under state control. During the early modern period, new universities were founded all over Europe. They became more and more bureaucratic, drawing up rules for examinations and becoming more streamlined in their organization. As for the curricula, Newtonian natural science had largely replaced Aristotelian physics by the end of the 17th century, and over the course of the 18th century, natural science grew in importance at the expense of theology and of humanist topics taught tradition, traditionally at faculties of the liberal arts, such as history and rhetoric. Nevertheless, the development of universities was not without setbacks. Whereas the 16th century had been the heyday for the growth of universities, the, numbers of, the number of students in Europe stabilized or even dropped in the 17th century. Then in the first half of the 18th century, registrations in southern universities started to increase again. The universities of the 18th century were increasingly populated by students drawn from the aristocratic layers of society. The international flow of scientific knowledge was quite lively throughout most of the period. The mobility of scholars was not only caused by wars and persecution. It tied in with the generation's old practice of students traveling around Europe for educational reasons, often following established routes. The University of Göttingen was especially popular for traveling students due partly to the propagation of practical studies. The mobility of pedagogical reformers, such as the Dutch Erasmus or the Bohemian Comenius, was facil facilitated by the universal use of Latin. However, with the rise of the vernacular and universities becoming more national in character, the traditional uh, study trip became a journey only enjoyed by aristocratic students. We are now shifting our focus on the 19th century when education and knowledge transfer underwent a complex and far-reaching transformation in Europe. This transformation can be grasped through central notions such as expansion, bureaucratization, professionalization, and the double dynamic of nationalization and internationalization. Expansion in education and knowledge transfer manifested itself in more ways than sheer numbers. Scientists developed new techniques and working methods, which significantly increased the capacity of science to shape and challenge the world. Medicine, for example, progressed enormously, first in its capacity to diagnose illnesses and later in its ability to cure or to prevent them. Louis Pasteur's work is an impressive example of the transfer of scientific knowledge to society. His vaccines dramatically reduced the mortality rate. Moreover, the so-called pasteurization, the mild heating of foods such as beer, milk or wine, improved public health, but also led to profound changes in agriculture and industry. The expansion of science also occurred on a global level. Scientists made spectacular travels around the globe, pushing the geographical boundaries of knowledge to map the world further. To mention only two examples, Charles Darwin's voyage from 1831 to 1836 proved instrumental in the development of his theory of evolution. The polymath Alexander von Humboldt 
troubled uh, the Americas and Central Asia, and his writings had a lasting impact on numerous scientific disciplines, including geography and ethnology. Although science presented itself as objective and impartial, its practice and its outcomes were far from neutral or innocent. The geographical expansion of science went hand in hand with the expansion of the European colonial empires. The world was divided into knowing subjects, Western white male scientists, and the rest of the world, which was simply an ob object of study. Indigenous peoples living in colonial empires were objectified by science. Instead of being consulted as possessors of knowledge, they were treated as objects of study and racial classification, supporting racial ideology underpinning the entire colonial project. The expansion of scientific knowledge in societies had its limits. For a long time, women could not advance in science because neither were there any positions for them, nor did they have a chance to enter university education until the end of the 19th century. Another important phenomenon in the period was the increasing state control and growing bureaucratization of science, education, and culture. Such administrative bodies as the Ministère de l'Instruction Publique in France or the Ministerium des Öffentlichen Unterrichtes in the Habsburg Monarchy were intended to allow the government to coordinate and reform educational activities in general, especially in higher education. Academy and university staff became increasingly dependent on financing from the government. The example of Habsburg Central Europe shows serious attempts at centralized coordination in education as well as its limits. The results varied considerably on the local level. Although the idea of general schooling was conceived as early as the late 18th century, and schooling did improve a great deal during the 19th century, which resulted in the considerable decrease of illiteracy, there were significant differences between the regions and nationalities of the empire. Whereas the Czech lands already boasted an impressive schooling system in the 1820s, illiteracy levels in Galicia remained high even in the 1870s. In science and humanities, the emergence of professionalization and differentiation was a major phenomenon during the 19th century. While medieval universities typically had only four faculties, theology, medicine, law, and philosophy, the 19th century saw the development of a broad system of subjects which led to the establishment of new faculties and institutes. An increasing demand for more practical subjects, such as engineering and chemistry, resulted in the establishment of natural and technological science faculties. Professionalization, cons uh, professionalization considerably changed the image of the humanist scholar. Rather than individualistic artist-like figures, academics became experts and members of a scientific community doing collective work. Objective measures of scientific achievement were established. The doctoral defense determined who would be accepted into the community of experts and who would be excluded. Specialized reviews served as the police of the disciplines by acknowledging scholars who acted according to the established rules of the field and excluding those who did not. Other than the already mentioned growing importance of state agencies and their financial resources for educational and scientific institutions, nationalization of education was also reflected in the rhetoric of teachers and lecturers. In the late 19th century, however, professionalization also changed how scholars regarded their, their larger community, the nation. Historians from Habsburg Central Europe, for example, tended to act less as the father of the nation and saw themselves more as a part of a scientific community that respected scientific standards, even if this meant sometimes challenging the prevailing ideology in their own national community. Many intellectuals who contributed to the awakening of their nation saw knowledge transfer and scientific knowledge as essential parts of national integration. A main concern was the cultivation, improvement, or in some cases, the quasi-invention of national language. In Habsburg Central Europe, several learned societies and academies were established during the first half of the century. Their profile and standard were largely determined by the respective communities' social development and position in the empire. 
In this region, the nationalization of universities frequently led to conflicts, the most famous case being of the Charles University of Prague, which was finally divided into a German and a Czech part in 1882 after violent conflicts between the Czech and German population of the city. Museums were also lined up in service of national integration. Their task was to strengthen the national community by elaborating a connection between its past, present, and future. With the concept elaborated by Benedict Anderson, one can say that these cultural institutions, as well as education and the humanities, contributed to shaping peoples imaginary in a way that they perceived themselves as a part of a national community. Nevertheless, besides the undoubtedly strong tendency of nationalization, the connections, crossings, and mutual influences between nations are also apparent in this period. The major forums of internationalization of science and humanities were the international congresses. From 1878 onwards, these congresses multiplied and contributed to the international structuring of scientific communities concerning both human and natural sciences. The internationalization of research also led in part to a standardization of instruments and methods, especially in the social and, nat and natural and technical sciences. International exchange was also important for emblematic figures of national nationalist movements who maintained contacts across national borders. For example, one of the founding fathers of the Czech national revival, Josef Dobrovsky, was in close contact with Ferenc Széchenyi, founder of the Hungarian National Museum. The transfer of scientific practices was not necessarily hindered by political differences. The German model of the research university, for example, was adopted by Austrian universities during the mid 1850s at the peak of the Austrian-Prussian rivalry for the unification of the German lands. Academies regularly honored famous scholars from rival nations. Reviews, even though their primary task was to promote national science and literature, were also sites of international transfer. It was through these reviews that, for example, French literature influenced the famous Viennese modernism. In the 20th century, several tendencies of the previous period developed further, such as professionalization, differentiation, and specialization. When discussing education and knowledge transfer in the 20th century, it is more effective to proceed chronologically. With the outbreak of the First World War, transnational exchange in culture, science, and education came to a temporary halt. The initial war euphoria in European societies also touched scientists who often showed solidarity with the political and military ambitions of their respective nations. Several professors dissolved their cooperation with colleagues from universities in enemy countries. International cooperation in science, culture, and education experienced a renaissance in the interwar period. Nevertheless, the nationalist agenda still affected the mindset of many intellectuals. For example, the reorganization of international scientific cooperation in the newly founded International Research Council excluded German and Austrian scientists after World War I, which practically meant that the lines of conflicts were maintained. Another important phenomenon that affected the academic world was the dynamics of forced migration. In Russia, for example, this began in the course of the 1917 revolution, when the first wave of scientists and artists emigrated from Russia to the Western countries. This proved to be a pattern as several waves of emigration from the USSR followed. During the Second World War, academic cooperation in Europe could scarcely be maintained. Overall, the consequences of the war on university life were enormous. They tended to be more drastic for the universities of Eastern and Southern Europe than those in Western and Northern Europe. In France, for example, some scholars secured the continuation of their research activities by cooperating with Nazi authorities, while others continued to work in silence. In much of Central and Eastern Europe, on the other hand, Nazis systematically destroyed scientific and research institutions. After the Second World War, Europe's universities, schools, and cultural institutions were mostly re-established within nationally oriented education and cultural systems. 
Nevertheless, the dynamic of internationalization also renewed. In Western Europe, the European Organization for Nuclear Research was founded in 1952 and the European Space Research Organization in 1964. Other inter international organizations fostering European and international policies in the fields of education were also set up. In addition, multilateral cultural and educational initiatives were launched in the process of Europe's political unification. The socialist countries of Europe mostly took and adopted the Soviet model of education after 1945. In general, all forms and levels of education were state-owned and free of charge. Russian was taught as the first foreign language all over Eastern Europe. Extracurricular activities focused on the ideological education of young people, while the church was deprived of its role in education, except in Poland. As for university life, the state enforced strict control over the humanities, fearing the genesis of uncontrolled ideas. Nevertheless, uncensored homemade publications called Samizdat were disseminated illegally. Political criticism and opposition to state ideology started to show up in science during the 1960s, one of the most important representatives of this shift being the physicist Andrei Sakharov, winner of the Nobel Peace Prize in 1975. During the Cold War, cooperation between East and West remained limited. Traveling abroad was a delicate issue in all socialist countries. It was not enough for scholars to have academic merits, they also had to be considered politically reliable. It was a great privilege to travel abroad even within the socialist camp. Nevertheless, a, re a rapprochement between actors from the Western and Eastern parts of Europe, blocked by the Iron Curtain, gradually became possible from the end of the 1950s. After the Second World War, the ties between science and industry strengthened because the war's outcome demonstrated the importance of scientific mobilization in times of conflict. In Germany, for example, the Fraunhofer Society was established in 1949 with the task of funding applied research. By the 1960s, a new dynamic was established as a result of the space race and the so-called Sputnik shock. The creation of the OECD, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development in 1961, provided an op opportunity across Western European states aimed at promoting industrial research. The ambitions to connect science and industry led to the creation of the Ministry of Technology in Great Britain in 1965 and the Agence Nationale de Valorisation de la Recherche in France in 1967. In 1965, the European Industrial Management Association was created with the support of the OECD. The association, which was established on the model of the US Industrial Research Institute, brought together major European companies on matter of research and development and helped establish links between the academic world. Europe in the 20th century was characterized by a general expansion of education and knowledge transfer. Broadly speaking, elementary education became available for almost all Europeans in the first half of the century. Secondary education became a desirable level of study after the Second World War. In university life, the most important phenomenon was the transformation of universities into mass institutions. Since the end of the 19th century, many European universities took increasing numbers of students. They still continued to address only a minority of the population and remained elite institutions. After the First World War, the trend of taking increasing number of students accelerated in Western Europe eventually leading to a fundamental transformation of universities from the 1960s onwards. As student numbers grew, universities transformed into mass institutions. This massification was some of many forces that drove protests around the year of 1968, which led to demands for the democratization of society in general and the educational system in particular. This trend was eventually also countered by educational offerings via new technologies. Distance learning and online universities, as well as video platforms, produce new forms of knowledge transfer. 
The nation state framework for science, culture, and education was transformed by alternative forms of knowledge transfer that were virtually independent of statehood. In addition, the standardization of courses and degrees gradually emerged in, emerged in the late 20th century and led, for instance, to the implementation of the Erasmus program, which co-finances the mobility of students and researchers in Europe ever since. Thank you for your attention.